thank you so much, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, it's a real honor to be able to come back and speak about my research to some folks who have known me since middle school, many of you. Um, I'll preface my talk by saying that a lot of this is going to be a an overview of the topics that Dr. Hazen has already covered. We're both interested in understanding Earth through minerals, and in Dr. Hazen's case, this is by cataloging millions of geological events and occurrences to build a greater understanding about how minerals work in general, and that's a really beautiful bottom-up approach to fact-finding. But my approach is sort of the opposite. As you'll see, I work more from the top down. I apply well-known facts about minerals as a set of tools to understand specific geologic events and occurrences in great detail. Okay, there it goes. So in the end though, regardless of the approach, the core goals remain the same. It's no coincidence that both of us want to understand Earth's history and the associated history of life on Earth because that's our own origin story. And this obsession with our backstory is what makes us human. We're the only species that shows real interest in truths greater than ourselves, be that in the form of science or religion or history. And so with that in mind, Earth history will motivate the problem I'm, stu I'm studying, the why of the research that I do. So let's start by walking through a timeline of Earth's history from its formation 4.56 billion years ago on the left to the present day on the right. And just for reference, you'll see this throughout the presentation, the symbol GA here just means billions of years ago. It stands for giga annum. It's just a, a convenient shorthand. A good way to think about the scale of this timeline is with the history of life on Earth, which I've drawn here in green. And as you can see, all the sort of familiar forms of life to us. So think trilobites, dinosaurs, mammals, us humans, etc. They're only a relatively recent invention from the last half a billion years or so. And for most of this timeline, living things were just single-celled bacteria. And the oldest life we have some idea existed is the last common ancestor of all life about 3.8 billion years ago or so, which would have been a bacterium that, by total coincidence, would have been very similar to the one that actually causes the disease rickets today. And of course, piecing together this whole story of life on Earth is one of the most active pursuits in the Earth sciences these days, for good reason. So for the last two and a half billion years, this story has been mostly controlled by changes in Earth's atmosphere and oceans. And as Dr. Hazen mentioned, one of the most important aspects of this is the accumulation of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere over time. And as a reminder, Earth's atmosphere would have started out with actually no oxygen at all. Living things are in fact responsible for putting all of that oxygen into the atmosphere. But because oxygen reacts with some of the earlier greenhouse gases in Earth history, like methane, when oxygen accumulates enough, Earth would sometimes go into these deep freeze events called snowball Earths that I'm drawing here, where the whole planet's surface would freeze over for a few million years at a time until volcanic gases and their greenhouse effect would eventually warm the surface back up again. And this happened at least three separate times in Earth history, the last of which left behind the very oxygen-rich atmosphere that we are still living in today and set the stage for the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago when most, again, modern complex kinds of life evolved. Uh, okay, there we go. So near the beginning of Earth history though, the I would argue that the biggest influences on life were most likely from beyond Earth. So the young solar system was a violent place and that would have bombarded the earth with asteroids, comets, and even in the case of the moon forming impact, a small planet that would have formed the moon and simultaneously produced a global magma ocean on earth for a few million years. And all these terrific impacts would have been very good at stabilizing the earth's surface pretty often, making things pretty inhospitable for any life trying to get a start. And this pummeling even erased, in part, the oldest rocks on Earth and left behind only a, a few really battered remnants in the form of zircon crystals that show up in some younger rocks, as we were talking about earlier. So throughout all of this, though, Earth's geological processes were humming away in the background, 
And we know a lot about the most recent of geological events, and all of these were guided by plate tectonics, slowly rearranging all of Earth's land masses and oceans to make new and interesting geography. And we even know, as Dr. Hazen alluded to, that the plates constructed a series of great supercontinents that broke apart and formed anew at least four times, and five depending on, on how big a continent you could call a supercontinent. And the last of these was the very famous Pangaea, home to the earliest dinosaurs about 300 million years ago. But looking back beyond about two, two and a half billion years ago, the story of plate tectonics grows very murky. In a weird way, this is because plate tectonics actually makes itself difficult to study in the deep past. It has, in the time since, tortured the ancient rocks that witnessed early tectonics, beating them down over billions of years with metamorphism, deformation, weathering, erosion. And the result is that nobody really knows when, in the first half of Earth history, plate tectonics got started. And therein lies one of the grand challenges of geology today. During the most important chapters in the story of life on Earth, its origins, its evolution from mere mud to metabolizing microorganisms, the geology that provided the setting, the backdrop of this story is totally mysterious to us. And if we can figure out how Earth's geology got started, we will learn a great deal about the living things that got started alongside it. So to illustrate just how little we know about early geology, I've drawn here a cross-section through a very familiar modern geological process called subduction. This is what happens when plate tectonic forces push two plates together, causing one to be subducted under the other. The downgoing as it dives into the hotter mantle below, and the melts it produces rise up and add to the overriding plate on top to make things like the magma chambers and volcanoes that I'm illustrating here. However, some researchers have hypothesized that on the early Earth, which was hotter in its interior, the lower parts of the crust would have been a lot weaker and were in fact so weak that they dripped effectively into the mantle below. And this would have resulted in similar, similar types of melting processes that could have added back onto the crust above, but the fundamental driving forces were a lot different in this sort of scenario. And on the extreme end, some researchers even suggest that plate tectonics didn't happen at all on the early Earth, and that would make the surface essentially just sit there without moving. And in this scenario, most of the ancient crust would have grown through processes somewhat like I'm showing here. This is a mantle plume, a column of superheated rock rising from the deep mantle and essentially torching the base of the crust to melt it and make it grow. And this happens in a few places today. And of course, Dr. Hazen is sitting in one of them right now. Hawaii is a great example of a mantle plume. But these researchers think that this may have actually been a dominant process in Earth's, in Earth's younger days. So again, just driving the, home this question one more time because it's so important. We're looking for the time when Earth started up its plate tectonic engine and started moving the surface around in the form of plates. Did this motion start four and a half billion years ago, three billion years ago, 0 0.8 billion years ago? So that's our task. That's what we're trying to answer. And that brings us to how I approach this problem. I'm a paleomagnetist, and to find my solution, we have to dig very deep. So deep that we've reached the Earth's core. So this glowing white hot orb at the center of the Earth is a roiling, churning ball of liquid iron and nickel metal. And what's cool about this is that because it's made of metal, it's electrically conductive. And because this conductive material is constantly in motion, it produces a magnetic field. And this magnetic field surrounds the Earth and helps shield it from ionizing radiation in space. There are a few key facts about the magnetic field that are important to point out for my research. So first, because the core is at the center of the Earth, the magnetic field emanates from the center of the Earth. Second, the field is shaped like the field of a bar magnet with a north pole on top and a south pole on bottom, or vice versa, that are 180 degrees apart exactly. Appropriately, this field with two poles is called a dipole. And finally, the rotation of the Earth on its axis organizes the churning motions of the liquid metal in the core that make these magnetic fields. 
into currents that spiral parallel to the rotation axis. And the end result is that the north and south poles of the magnetic field get lined up with the rotation axis up and down. And this is why a compass is actually useful to us. It points towards magnetic north, which also happens to coincide pretty closely with Earth's rotational north pole on average. So these facts about the geometry of Earth's magnetic field mean very significantly that we can use it as a reference frame, a baseline off of which we can measure the positions of things within it. And there are two types of information about position that we can measure. First, on the left, I'm be, because the magnetic field lines loop from the South Pole to the North Pole, the magnetic field direction gets steeper with latitude and changes de smoothly depending on what latitude you're at. So for instance, if you're at the South Pole, the field points directly up out of the ground. If you're on the equator, the field points horizontally and due north. And on the North Pole, the field points directly down into the ground. And this means that if a tectonic plate changes its latitude as it gets pushed around by tectonic forces, it sees the dip angle of the magnetic field at its location change as well. The other thing that the magnetic field can tell us about position has to do with the horizontal direction that points towards north. So th that's the azimuth or declination of the direction. So if a tectonic plate rotates in the course of its motion, it will see this northern direction of the magnetic field change as it's rotating. So together, these two pieces of information about the direction of the magnetic field can tell us about the position of tectonic plates. And in fact, this is how, for much of Earth's history, the plate tectonic reconstructions of how plates came together and rifted apart, this is how we actually construct that history. So if we can find a way to measure how these directions change over time, we can then track how ancient rocks have shuffled around on Earth's surface. And of course, that is intimately tied into our question of whether or not plate tectonic motion was happening on the early Earth. So fortunately for us, rocks themselves and the minerals they contain are often great at recording the direction of the magnetic field when they form. And this is because there are a handful of minerals that incorporate iron in such a way that they can get magnetized in Earth's magnetic field. And the main ones of importance are magnetite and hematite that I'm showing here. And if these form just right and don't get disturbed too much later on, they can hold on to and preserve their magnetic signals for many billions of years. Tiny grains of these minerals are basically microscopic compasses that geological events can move, but then freeze in place as well, so that they preserve that, that field direction. And what's great is that all of, these, the, all of these minerals show up in pretty much all rocks on Earth to some extent. These minerals will serve as our windows, our time capsules, into how the crust has moved through the Earth's magnetic field. So now we're armed and ready to go forth and look for these ancient magnetic minerals, but we have to figure out where to go to find them first. And the answer is that we have to find rocks that are well-preserved, but very, very old. And these oldest splinters of rock are preserved in ancient pieces of crust called cratons, which are the green blobs on this map. And these only make up about 5% of Earth's surface today. And only a few of these are well-preserved enough for the paleomagnetic work that I do. So the one that I'll be showing you and talking about today is the Pilbara Craton in northwestern Australia on this map. So we're going to zoom in and take a look at a satellite view of the Pilbara, just for some eye candy and reference. And you can see the Pilbara is the area inside this white outline. And as you can see, despite being on the coast, it's a desert and it's inescapably remote. The biggest town in its interior is called Marble Bar and has about 170 people in it, give or take. This town also, by the way, has the notorious distinction of being Australia's hottest place. And we go there in the Australian winter, our summer, when the daytime temperatures only get into the 90s Fahrenheit. In their summers, it can get into the 130 degree range and it will stay above 100 degrees for months at a time, even at night. Also, Pretty much everything about the Pilbara is old, 
even its people are old. This land hosts what are possibly the oldest human rock artworks anywhere in the world at about 50,000 years old. And of course, the rocks they're carved on are three and a half billion years old. So before I continue, I, I think it's a good idea to give you a sense of scale for how big the Pilbara is in the grand scheme of things. So I'm going to flash up another satellite photo taken of a different area at exactly the same scale. So ta-da, turns out the Pilbara is almost exactly the same size as the US state of Virginia. Um, you can keep that fact in your back pocket if, if ever this remote odd place that I'm talking about feels alien. It's just a, another piece of crust that looks that is about the same size as Virginia. Of course, the Pilbara looks nothing like Virginia when you're there. It's rugged, barren, and everything unfortunate enough to have to live there wants nothing more than for you to please go away. All the plants are spiny, the animals are in large part venomous, but for geologists like me, it's a playground. You can see in this photo just how much rock is sitting out exposed. And incidentally, a lot of that exposure is because the plants burn in these massive brush fires that happen all year round. They're kind of scary sometimes, but that doesn't keep us from having a little dramatic fun from time to time. As you can see, I'm there's yours truly moonlighting as uh, in his role as Lucifer in a new play. So looking down at the rocks, though, that you can find in the Pilbara, will give you hints about the much, much weirder environments that made them billions of years ago. This rock, for instance, that's being collected by my intrepid advisor, Roger Fu, is called a banded iron formation, and, and Bob Hazen mentioned this in his presentation earlier. It's made of iron oxides and silicate minerals that literally snowed out of the prehistoric oceans because they were saturated with iron. Unlike today's oxygenated ocean, that iron enough. The oxygen reacts with the iron before it can concentrate. On rare occasions, we also run into interesting layers of rock full of these little spheres. It turns out these are impact spherules. These are what rain out of the clouds of ejecta thrown up by giant asteroid impacts, and I really mean giant. These asteroids are calculated to be hundreds of times the size of the one that wiped out the dinosaurs about 60 million years ago. So it goes without saying that early Earth would probably not have been a great vacation spot. No oxygen to breathe, meteorite impacts causing giant tsunamis all over the place. But still, we can sometimes find fossil evidence of early life doing its thing. So this isn't necessarily from the Pilbara. This is actually from a very similar craton in South Africa called the Kapval. But see those black layers in this block of sandstone? So those little black lines are actually fossilized microbial mats. They're basically just a layer of bacterial scum that grows on top of the sand and then gets buried by more sand and the cycle repeats. And they're black, in fact, because they're so well preserved to this day that the carbon from those microbes is actually still there. It's, and it's black in color, 3.2 billion years later. So, now that we've paid respects to our ancestors, which these more than likely are at least part of, we come to the rocks that I am most interested in, the lavas. So these pictures show an ancient type of lava called a comatiite, and this holds the title for the hottest stuff that has ever belched out of Earth and onto the surface. So whereas today's hottest lavas are, again, Hawaii, the basalts that erupt in Hawaii at about 1200, maybe 1300 degrees Celsius, these things screamed out of the earth at a raging white hot 1700 degrees. They're so hot that when they freeze, these lavas solidify into olivine crystals that are a fraction of a millimeter wide, but up to a meter long. And they're actually, you can see them in this picture on the right, they're the dark streaks crisscrossing that rock sample. Those are the olivines. So the fact that they're so hot is neat and very impressive, but I study them for a very different reason. These lavas are rich in iron, and therefore they have lots of little magnetite grains that make them really excellent magnetic field recorders in deep time. These lavas will be our time capsules that will reveal to us the ancient magnetic field and how it's changed 
So that brings us to the lavas I'm going to be talking about in detail today. They're from the Kunaguna Rina Formation, and that magnificent name comes from the local word Kunanganaranga in the local language of the Kariara indigenous people. It means river bend, essentially. So viewed from above and looking to the northeast, this is the area that we did all of our field work in. So on the next slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a virtual cutaway of this landscape to show the geology underneath in cross section. And here's what that geology looks like. Again, you can see I've highlighted the portion of it that's the Kunaguna Rina formation here. So the lavas in this formation are that this sort of average forest green shade that you that you see in most of this picture, right? This shade. And pretty much all the other shades, so these grays and browns are sedimentary rocks, think sandstone or shale, that sort of get laid down at the same time intermittently as the lavas are also being erupted. And these lavas and sediments were all originally laid down flat on the sea floor, but they have since been tilted on end by later geological events and folding. Overlaying on top of this are sample sites in blue and red, these, these are where we grabbed all of our samples from. So I'm dividing them into sites, sampling sites from the lower, older half of the formation in blue down here, and the younger, uppermost part of the formation in red right here. This will be pretty important later. And this is what that sampling process actually looks like in the field. So at each of those sampling sites, we drill about 10 small holes into the rocks. And out of each hole, we extract a nice, neat, one inch wide core sample, like the one that I'm picturing here on the lower left. And what's nice about these core samples is that you can actually orient them very precisely, which we obviously need to do because we're care, we care about measuring directional changes of the magnetic field that these samples recorded. And when we get the samples back to our lab, we can throw them into this instrument. So it's, it's just a magnetometer. And all it does is it measures the magnetic moment of our samples very precisely. Our samples could be 100,000 times less magnetic, basically, than a compass needle. And this machine would still have no problem picking up their signals. Now, that high precision comes with an eye-watering $600,000 price tag which is why I am, again, immensely privileged to be allowed to use this thing on a regular basis. This is part and parcel of scientific equipment. As Michael was re referencing with uh, the rough database in Raman spectroscopy, it's gonna be a long time before the everyman has access to magnetometers or Raman machines like these. So when we measured our samples to simplify the data that we collected a little bit, what I'm showing here is the pattern of directions of the ancient magnetic field that we found. So at each of our sampling sites, the dots on this, this map, um, the arrow points towards the implied ancient direction of the magnetic field at those sites. And what we immediately noticed was that the sites from the older part of the formation in blue preserved a direction that's about 180 degrees away from the younger sites in red. Now, I I think I mentioned earlier that we, I've, I've mentioned that there is a feature of the Earth's magnetic field that can produce an 180 degree separation like this. And that's the fact that the North and South Poles are 180 degrees apart by definition. So what this pattern signifies is that this is what it looks like when the North and South magnetic poles flip, they exchange places. And this is called a geomagnetic reversal. And these, these reversals happen all the time. We see them all the time in big stacks of lavas like these when we're taking our measurements. But this one is really, really cool for two reasons. So the first is practical. It's that this pattern results from the rocks recording a change in the magnetic field that happens while they are being laid down, right? The rocks on the bottom half in blue get laid down first, they record one field direction, and then the field flips and the rocks on top of them record the opposite field direction. And what that means is that our rocks are preserving a magnetization that dates to when they were actually laid down 3.25 billion years ago. And that confirms that we're actually seeing the old signals, the ancient signals of the magnetic field that we want and not some younger overprinting magnetization 
which is constantly something that we have to worry about. However, the much cooler fact about this particular reversal is that as of this presentation, this is the oldest geomagnetic reversal ever documented to science. No one has ever seen one greater than about 2.8 billion years old. And we just found one that's almost half a billion years older. And we're obviously very excited about that. And that's because this represents the oldest real confirmation that Earth's magnetic field looked like this picture. We can actually see the dipole of the field. And it was also aligned well with Earth's rotational axis because that's the only way really to easily make a perfect 180 happen like this. So all of this is to say that the ancient magnetic field was likely playing much the same role as it does today in shielding Earth's surface from the nasty ionizing radiation whizzing around in outer space that could be hazardous to things on the surface. So some paleomagnetists would call this plenty good enough and move on with tectonic analyses. Um, but for those of you who know me, you would know that I am a kind of a stickler for unnecessary levels of detail sometimes. And fortunately for me, so is my advisor, Roger. So we have focused first on answering another question, a tangent, that I will be talking about for quite a while here. So buckle in. How did these lavas get magnetized? That's our first question. So typically, if you see a reversal pattern like this, it means that the lavas are preserving the magnetic field from when they cooled down immediately after eruption, right? When these, when these lavas erupt onto the surface, they're non-magnetic because they're too hot for their, their constituent minerals to record a magnetic field. But when they cool through those minerals' critical temperatures, they're called unblocking temperatures, um, they, the magnetic minerals lock in and freeze in that magnetic signal. So that's usually what happens to make a pattern like this that we're seeing. Um, we, though, want to test that and hopefully learn more about how and when the magnetization arose exactly. So answering this question involves looking in detail at the microscopic minerals that are preserving the magnetization we measured. We go to the micromineral handbook, basically. So to do so, I prepare subsamples of all of my cores for microscopic analysis and imaging. And this isn't quite like how most micromineral viewing is accomplished, where you typically would just mount a raw chunk of rock onto a base and maybe put little indicating arrows on it to point out the minerals of interest. What we do instead is that we slice very thin sections of our rocks, only about a third of a tenth of a millimeter thick, sometimes thicker if it's not necessary to control the thickness very well. And that means that they actually become transparent to light for the most part. And we glue these sections onto glass slides and polish them down to a mirror finish. And if you do this properly, it's called thin section preparation. Geologists all over the world do this for their rocks as well. So I then take these sections over to a few different types of analytical microscopes. So the first one, funny enough, we actually just heard a load about from Michael. It's a Raman spectrometer microscope that I'm showing here. Um, just to overview again how it works, it shines light at your samples and looks very carefully at the light that gets reflected back. And about one in a million light photons reflect back with a little more or less energy than they started with because these photons have interacted with chemical bonds in the sample. And the photons gain or lose the exact amount of energy that is essentially inherent to those chemical bonds. And this is, this is called Raman scattering, and it's named after the scientist who described it first and won a Nobel Prize for it. And the peaks on Raman spectra that, again, we saw in the rough database and that I'm showing here on the right, indicate that the sample contains chemical bonds with those specific energies. And the peaks, the set of peaks for a sample, can serve as a really good fingerprint for identifying different minerals because different minerals have different sets of peaks. And therefore, because, and, and that's a result of the fact that they contain many different chemical bonds. So this Raman microscope is very convenient because it allows me to analyze non-destructively areas that are only a few microns wide, making it possible to single out individual microscopic mineral grains that can, that can then be identified one by one rather, rather than in ensemble, in a bulk sample. So that's what we use it for. We use this to identify all of the minerals in our samples with this. And of course, the rough database is a 
wonderful resource for this. It's it's by far the most sort of comprehensive thing that we have access to in terms of these fingerprints, these spectra that are good references that allow us to identify all of these really unusual mineral species. Oh yeah, and by the way, um, this this instrument is not in my lab. It's in a another lab in the same building. And I've been they've been gracious enough to give me access to it. The owner of this microscope says that the plush dinosaur that you can see sitting on top of the microscope here is very, very important. You cannot forget the plush dinosaur or it will not work. So keep that in mind whenever you're taking Raman spectra in the future. Do not forget the plush dinosaur. So the coolest microscope that we use, though, is this contraption that my advisor actually developed when he was a grad student along with a physics lab. This is called a quantum diamond microscope. It really sounds like something straight out of a Marvel movie, but we call it the QDM for short. And what this thing does is it takes microscopic pictures of the magnetic fields on the surface of a sample. And it does that with a small little chip of synthetic diamond. It's this little red square here. Um, and this diamond is specially prepared to contain two things. One is a trace amount of nitrogen atoms that substitute for the carbon atoms in the, in the diamond's structure. And the other are empty spots, vacant sites, places where a carbon atom is just missing and there's nothing there to replace it. And crucially, these diamonds are prepared in such a way that these nitrogen, these nitrogen atoms and empty spaces in the lattice of the diamond are paired up with each other. And these nitrogen vacancy centers, as they're called, have really interesting quantum mechanical properties that are very convenient for us. And that's because those color centers fluoresce red when a green laser is shined on them. And the intensity of that fluorescence actually depends on the local magnetic field. So by carefully taking pictures of this diamond, when we've pressed it up against our sample's polished surface, we can pretty literally take photos of the magnetic field sources in those samples at micron scale. And this gives us the ability, the capability to look at a sample under this microscope and say that magnetite grain right there is carrying part of this sample's magnetic signal. And as you'll soon see, that ability is very powerful. So now I am gonna move on to what we actually saw with all of these instruments. So our samples have a lot of the features and textural characteristics that you would expect to find in fairly high temperature lavas. So this image shows a whole bunch of forsterite olivine crystals with these really intricate and interesting, delicate cage-like shapes and habits. These skeletal crystals, as they're called, form when the lava cools especially quickly. And so the crystals only have time to grow along their edges and corners rather than on their faces, essentially. And that's pretty neat. Now, these were olivine crystals when the lava erupted. But since then, as, we, as I have quickly learned with the Raman spectrometer, the olivine has actually been entirely replaced by the mineral chlorite, in this case, the clinochlor and member of chlorite. And this implies, interestingly, that these olivines must have reacted with water at some point because chlorite minerals have hydroxide, a water derivative, in their crystal structures, while olivine absolutely does not. So water was somehow involved in changing this rock. Here's another example of original minerals being replaced by hydrated ones. So the light tan colored crystals like this one and this one right here are in this image are augite crystals that they're clinopyroxenes that cooled directly from the lava, just like the olivines in the previous picture did. But if you look carefully though, these augites are darker along their edges. See that sort of darker, more saturated brown tone along the edge of this grain and the sort of purely darker edge on this grain right here. So those darker places are because those edges have reacted with water in the surrounding material in the rock to form a mineral called actinolite, an amphibole mineral that has hydroxide in its structure. And you can see also a lot of other chlorite examples in the matrix, another hydrated phase. So 
that this this stuff, this sort of again forest green shade that's present in a few splotches throughout this sample, that's the chlorite. So there are some cases also where we can see evidence for even more extensive water reactions. So these light colored circles in this lava sample are vesicles. So these would have been originally gas bubbles in the lava flow that, that form when the lava flow cools down. And they've been infilled by calcite that was precipitated there by calcium and carbonate rich water. Now that water also reacted with the areas surrounding the vesicles. And you can see that as these dark green halos, these dark regions on this image. And those halos are predictably full of actinolite. They're full of, again, that hydrated phase that results from altering clinopyroxenes, augites, the, which are the little sort of needle-shaped um, crystals in the sort of ground mass, the matrix of this sample, um, to incorporate water instead. Some samples also show evidence for multiple types and timings of water reactions. So this sample, for instance, has two veins that have been infilled by hydrothermal precipitates. Um, so there's an early one right here. So this light white colored one is full of clear albite. And a later one that cross cuts through that is filled with this rust colored calcite. So there's evidence that the composition of the minerals that are getting precipitated and, and changed by the water that's reacting with these rocks is changing slightly over time as well. Another group of minerals that are very commonly precipitated by water are sulfides. And our rocks are, of course, full of those too. So this picture shows a garden variety of several different sulfides. So these really bright ones like this one up here and this one down here are pyrite. The sort of more saturated yellow ones like this and this and this are chalcopyrite, so iron and copper sulfides in addition to just iron. And this sort of orange and this maroon hue are both crystals of sphalerite, um, so a zinc sulfide. And we found more than just these. We've also found covalite, we found galena, a lead sulfide. So there's a pretty good diversity of different sulfide minerals that are all apparently precipitated by fluids, by water-based fluids in our rocks. Our samples also contain this really unusual material that's preserved as these sort of stringy bits in calcite. So again, this background material that's just white is calcite. But these little stringy bits of dark material are carbonaceous matter. It, it's basically just cooked organic matter. It's what happens when you take living things, bacteria or plants, what have you, and cook it under intense heat and pressure. And it basically forms coal or oil. Um, we would call this kerogen in more sort of technical jargon. And finding this is actually really exciting for us because if you can measure the Raman spectrum of this material, its Raman peaks actually change their shape depending on the maximum temperature that they've experienced in their lifetime. So here's what that Raman spectrum looks like in this example. And the shape of these peaks indicate that it has been cooked up to about 320 Celsius or so, give or take a little bit. And this tells us that the water reacting with these rocks to produce all of these altered hydrous minerals was fairly hot, not lava hot, of course, but still 320 degrees hot. And the term in the biz for this heated water is hydrothermal fluid, and you'll be hearing that a lot. Okay, so uh, what about the magnetic minerals that you all came here for, though? So this is a picture of the edge of one of those vesicles from before. And as you can see again, there's the vesicle up in the upper right in tan, and that's the calcite infilling it. And surrounding it is this dark green alteration halo of actinolite. Um, and in the background ground mass, the matrix of this sample, there's a bunch of little needles like this one and this one and this one of augite, clinopyroxene crystals. And there's a finer grained assemblage of other mineral species in the matrix of that material. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to overlay a quantum diamond microscope magnetic map of this same field of view that we're looking at on top of this image. So there's a little bit to unpack here. 
So here's how to interpret what I've, what I've just put up. So the reds and blues in this magnetic map are the magnetic field sources. They're the magnetic fields that have been measured by the QDM and are detectable. The red just means that the magnetic field is pointing up, sort of out of the screen at you. And the blue means down into the screen away from you. And I've also, for convenience, highlighted the minerals that I was talking about earlier. So again, there's the outline of the vesicle in this blue outline and shading. Um, there's the outline of the dark green actinolite alteration halo and the little augite needles that are present throughout the matrix of this sample are the outlines in white here. So what's immediately obvious is that the most magnetic stuff in this field of view is the matrix between all of these individual little clinopyroxene grains, right? So the clinopyroxene grains typically don't have that many field sources in them, but the matrix does. It has a lot of these really fine disseminated little sources of magnetism. So I'm going to zoom in on this area right here near the bottom right and look at those field sources in more detail with a conventional light microscope. And if we zoom in, we see that the magnetic signals are pretty clearly being carried by these little black mineral grains. And these are magnetites. These are actually what are carrying the magnetic signal in this rock. And some of them are extremely fine, like this string that I've just put up on the right of magnetite grains that we took a picture of an electron microscope from the same sample that are each only a few hundred nanometers wide. Again, getting into the nano minerals rather than just microminerals. And again, true to the theme of hot hydrothermal fluids, hot water reacting with everything, they're surrounded by minerals like titanite and albite that form by reactions between rocks and water. And this suggests that the magnetite itself also could have grown through the same sorts of chemical reactions. Hydrothermal reactions can actually even also turn non-magnetic minerals into magnetic ones. So this is a great example. This is a chromite crystal that would have, again, crystallized directly out of the lava flow when it cooled. And chromite shouldn't be magnetic at all. It's non-magnetic at room temperature. But as you can probably tell from its very spongy looking messy interior, it has been corroded by, you guessed it, hydrothermal fluids. And this has turned it mostly into magnetite by exchange of the chromium and the chromite for iron to isostructurally turn it into magnetite. And that magnetite means that this, this nominally non-magnetic mineral, because it's been altered, lights up like a Christmas tree on a magnetic map. So it's also carrying some of the signal. Circling back to the vesicles, because as you'll see, they're very informative. Um, these are, again, the ga those gas bubbles that would have, would have formed in the lava flows. These vesicles often get filled in by more than one, just one type of precipitated mineral from hydrothermal fluids. And in this case, in fact, this vesicle got filled in by three different groups of minerals at three different times, which I'm going to overlay. So the first one, shown in white, would have coated the rim of this vesicle and filled in the smaller ones around it. And this was probably either chalcedony or chlorite originally. It's a little hard to say um, because it's actually been overprinted by later mineralogical changes that I'll get to. Um, the second mineral group formed these little rosettes that I'm showing in orange on the vesicle walls, the, what's labeled with two here. And finally, the third mineral to precipitate was calcite, which I'm showing in blue here. And it so happens that that calcite is really good at corroding away, essentially, at the other minerals that had already precipitated into the vesicle. So most of the material in this vesicle now is made of calcite rather than the original minerals that it would have started out with. So again, overlaying a magnetic map taken with the QDM on top of this vesicle, it actually paints a very clear picture. It shows very clearly how one of these infill mineral groups, so the, the one that I had labeled two, the orange sort of rosettes that would sort of adhere to the vesicle walls, they're responsible for very strong magnetic signals. They're carrying a substantial fraction of the magnetic signals in this sample and many of our other samples as well. 
And those little orange rosettes are just jam packed with field sources, so much so that it's saturating our detector and on our QDM, actually. So we can actually zoom in to these field sources and again, look at them in more detail now that we've identified that they're responsible for the magnetization in our rocks. And what we can see is that they're actually little magnetite needles. And if you look hard at them also, you'll see that the needles tend to align with each other. So for instance, this one right here is sort of pointing this way, same direction as this one is pointing, and this one down here, and this one over here. And this, this pattern of very aligned needles of magnetite is actually pretty characteristic of magnetite that exsolves out of other minerals, especially plagioclase feldspars. And that happens when iron migrates out of the crystal structures of the original mineral, say like a labradorite crystal, and then accumulates in these little needles of magnetite that because they're forming inside of a larger crystal, they align with the relative, with sort of preferred directions within those crystals lattices. Um, and you can see these for yourself if you have a chunk of labradorite that's been polished. You can actually look at that under a microscope and you will see, if you're lucky, some of these little magnetite needles. They're much bigger in the uh, in labradorite samples that you, you and I would buy for their intensely pretty iridescent colors. Um, these, of course, are much, much smaller. As you can see from the scale bar here, they're, they're sub-micron in scale. This is an electron microscope image. Um, okay, so that is very cool to see, but how did we end up with those little orange rosettes is the question, right? We know that they're responsible for hosting a lot of the magnetization in these samples, but how did they get there? Why, why are there these these rosettes that are full of what was originally plagioclase and still magnetite that grew in these empty vesicles. How might that have gotten there? Well, being a true Northern Virginian, I thought back to the coolest orange rosettes I'd ever seen, which are the stellarite rosettes from the Vulcan Manassas quarry. These are zeolite minerals that form in potentially a very similar way. They are direct hydrothermal precipitates that form doing fluid alteration of a rock with a very similar composition, a diabase in this case. So they might be a very good modern analog for the rosettes I see in my rocks. And so I took one of these little, well, plucked off of a, of a not so pretty as this sample. Um, I plucked one of these rosettes off sliced it open with a saw, polished it, prepared it the same way, and looked at it under a microscope. And lo and behold, in between all of those stellarite crystals, which are the light areas in this, in this uh, image, um, the interstices between these crystals are filled with plagioclase with little grains of magnetite in them, exactly like the rocks that I'm studying from Australia. It's super neat to see such a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. And also never did I ever think my heritage as a rock hound would so directly help my research, but here I am looking at rocks from the same quarry that I went to as a middle schooler and got me interested in the earth sciences when I found pieces of its prenite from the parking lot of my elementary school. Okay, so we have talked at great length now and pretty exhaustively shown that the magnetic signals in these rocks came from hydrothermal alteration, from reacting with hot water. But we still need to explain where this hot water came from and how this led to the reversal pattern we measured earlier. Because again, this reversal pattern is typically a signature of a different type of way to magnetize rocks, again, by cooling in the presence of a field rather than growing magnetic minerals in the presence of a field. So as it turns out, the answer to this ended up being very straightforward and took us a little bit by surprise. So during our field work, we actually found two places, which I'm showing in sort of blue, oops, which I'm showing in blue and red here, where we found extensive hydrothermal deposits and veins. And these are basically layers of rock that are filled with, in this case, quartz and sulfide minerals that grew directly from hydrothermal fluids. And they have these, sometimes have these really neat concentric uh, 
growth textures like this example in the photo in the top. This is quartz that would have precipitated directly into one of these veins. And the black is because it's full of this carbonaceous matter that I had mentioned before. And these form when magma intrudes under seafloor rocks. And the intense heat from this magma acts in much the same way as a lava lamp does. It literally pulls seawater into the rocks on the ocean floor through convection. And that seawater churning in a convection oven, basically above these, these really hot magma bodies within rocks, chemically react with the rocks. And the water and rocks exchange minerals with each other as they encounter each other. And eventually, the now mineral-rich water gets spit back out into the ocean through faults and veins, forming these hydrothermal deposits and their feeders. Um, a common example of this in the modern Earth that you and I might be familiar with are black smokers. These are those chimneys that just belch out sulfides on the ocean floor that you know people send ROVs down to investigate. So now, with this new information, the hydrothermal minerals make a lot more sense. And with that new information, we can now construct, we can reconstruct, excuse me, how these rocks got magnetized in the first place. So first, a stack of basalt flows and chromatiate flows would have erupted onto the ocean floor. And this would eventually become the lower half of the Kunigun Arena formation that we sampled. And after they erupted, a hydrothermal circulation event happened, perhaps due to a granite magma chamber getting put in place nearby, and that heat would have driven hydrothermal circulation. And that hydrothermal circulation would circulate hot seawater through these rocks, reacting with them and producing these magnetic minerals and other minerals as well that arise, that, that produce this magnetization that points down the Earth's approximate magnetic field direction at the time. In this case, it would have been pointing more or less down fairly steeply. And later on, more lava flows erupted on top of the already altered rocks below. And crucially, sometime in this interval, while these this second set of lavas are erupting, Earth's magnetic field would have flipped its poles in a geomagnetic reversal event. And this was followed one more time by yet another hydrothermal episode that reacted these rocks with seawater. And this magnetized the upper lavas along Earth's magnetic field. But this time, the Earth's field was pointing up approximately, thanks to the fact that there was a geomagnetic reversal in between. But because the rocks below had already formed stable magnetite and had essentially already reacted, they were not nearly so affected and were not remagnetized by this new event and actually retained their original field directions. So the final event in all of this is that these rocks were all tilted and folded by a later tectonic event, and then they got uplifted and eroded to expose them for us to walk around and sample on. So now that we really understand well the sequence of events that led to these magnetic signals, we need to nail down exactly when those magnetic signals happened. So in other words, we have to date, we have to figure out exactly when those hydrothermal events that magnetized our rocks happened when did these rocks sort of, again, get magnetized by these events in red and blue here. So for the younger one that I'm showing in red here, it turns out this event is widely reported on by other geologists in the area. They've done a lot of field work and radiometric dating work and have dated it precisely to 3.238 billion years ago. And However, the blue one on the bottom is trickier. It's an older event that no one has really looked at in great detail before. So that means I had to. And fortunately, our samples gave us exactly what we needed to do so. These bright sort of elongated diamond-shaped mineral grains in some of our samples are crystals of titanite, also called sphene. It's a calcium, titanium, or silicate mineral that formed late in the sequence of hydrothermal reactions in these samples. And what's useful about it here is that uranium four plus ions can substitute in trace amounts for the titanium four plus that's naturally present in the titanite's crystal structure. And that uranium makes this mineral suitable for uranium-led radiometric dating. 
where we measure exactly how much of the isotopes of uranium have decayed into isotopes of lead. And then, based on that information, we can back out how long the decay process has taken in full, and thus when the titanites formed in the first place. So this plot with the little shaded spots on it are the results of that radiometric dating work. And while the principles behind this plot are unfortunately too complicated for me to go into in, in much detail for now, um, I will simplify a bit. So see this sweeping white curve that sort of cuts the plot in half diagonally with the numbers next to it? So those numbers are in millions of years. And basically what we're looking for is the that the age of the titanites that we're trying to get at is the lowest point on this curve where these shaded uh, points that we have measured sort of line up with the curve and coincide with it. And I've highlighted the, that point in green here and the few points that are closest in green. And the point along this curve that that ends up happening at is cor corresponds, according to these numbers, the, with the age approximately that these titanites grew. And we ended up measuring an age of between 3.27 and 3.23 GA or so, billions of years ago. So centered on approximately 3.25 billion years old, which is very conveniently, perfectly in line with what we would have expected for the age of these rocks. So now we can add that age to our picture here. So again, that's the 3.25 GA that I've just measured from these samples here. So to summarize, thanks to really careful microscopic analysis of all of the minerals present in our rocks, not just the magnetic ones, we've built up this really complete picture of exactly how and when these rocks formed, got altered, and got magnetized, and were rewarded with this really interesting record of magnetic directions that we can be confident in comparing to other similar ones from nearby rocks. So let's do that. Let's compare this with previous results from rocks of other ages nearby and finally attempt to answer that big question that we've been trying to answer this whole time. Did plate tectonics shift around the blocks of Earth's early crust? And the answer appears so far to be yes. So this map, this plot here, shows how the position of the Pilbara Craton has changed over time where the x-axis is just time proceeding from left to right in billions of years ago. And the y-axis is the latitude, the ancient latitude of the Pilbara at those times. And you can also see that the Pilbara, I've drawn it in such a way that it, if it rotates, I also rotate it on this plot. So you can clearly see that around 3.3 billion years ago, the Pilbara drifted from pretty near the equator to towards the magnetic pole. And it drifted at a speed that we can calculate at about six centimeters per year or so. And it also actually in the, in the intervening years around 3.2 billion years ago, rotated subtly at again, about half a degree every million years. And this is very clearly motion. And what's super interesting is that these sort of rates of motion of rotation and latitudinal drift line up very well with plate tectonic rates on the modern Earth. And as, as an example for comparison, right now the Atlantic Ocean is currently spreading apart and it's moving us away from Europe, unless you're in Europe, of course, or another continent. And, and it's also moving us away from, it's, it's basically spreading the new world and old world apart. And that rate of motion is about four centimeters a year or so. So the continental drift of the Pilbara back then was actually a little faster than a pretty typical plate tectonic rate right now. So what does this mean for the early Earth? Well, it, it appears that despite some key differences, its interior was hotter than today, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, Earth 3.3 billion years ago was actually remarkably similar to the modern Earth, and it was already showing signs of geological maturity. Plate tectonics was probably shaping and reshaping the surface as the mantle stirred underneath, creating many of the same surface features that we have today. Mountain ranges, volcanoes, great plains, shallow oceans, deep, deep seas and trenches, hot springs, just to name a few. And at the center of it all was this churning core driving a strong, stable magnetic field 
that would have protected the surface from the harsh radiation of space, just like it does today. In summary, my work is showing that the early Earth was already a dynamic machine and a machine covered in the sticky coating of bacteria that we call our ancestors. So with that, a quick word of thanks to those who have been helping me on this project. Chief among them, of course, is Roger, my advisor on the top, who's been a wonderfully patient mentor and extremely knowledgeable. Um, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues who have helped in sort of tangential ways, like Jairo, who helped me with field work, George, who has advised us on how rocks alter in their alteration patterns, Andrew, who's dated our samples for us and been a really invaluable source of geochronology advice, and Brad, who has helped us refine our geodynamic conclusions. With that, I have nothing more to share, and I would be thrilled to take any questions you have. Thank you.